Welcome to the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. Brian, welcome to the end of the world. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I, I don't know what you're referring to. I, is there something going on? <laughs> You've not been out of your bomb shelter? You have to leave. I Listen, I've been in the bomb shelter with Jared Leto for the last <laughs> week. <laughs> well, the rate on gas is not, uh, is not good down there. You should uh, limit your time in the bomb shelter. You can't do a 12-day uh, Leto escape. Yeah, you're right. And actually, let's start with that. What, where is the radon meter reading at with you uh, in your house? Because we're still, well, this is week three of the radon meter in James's house. Week three, yes. I'm pleased to announce that they are steady and level. So okay. they're up, they're around 76. The first okay. week they, they sat in the 50s and even in the 40s at times, but, uh, and they peaked in, I would say, 85. So yeah, so far so good. Now, mind you, I've stopped keeping the window shut this last week because uh, mm -hmm. I just needed fresh air. Um, yeah. yeah, and it, it gets really hot in the bedroom here where I am today. And by the way, we should mention that we are social isolating, isolating socially. Yeah, and you know, there's been a lot of jokes going around on the internet, people on Twitter making jokes about, uh, you know, starting a podcast while they're in quarantine. <laughs> Screw them, we're way ahead of you. We're way ahead of the curve. This is episode six, I believe. So wow. we're, we're six weeks ahead of the curve. We should be good by now. So I'm in my home and you're in your bomb shelter. I miss it. I, I can picture it though, having done yeah. five episodes there. Sure. And you record podcasts in your home anyway. So you kind of have your own setup there. Yes. I apologize if we talk over each other. We're using Skype, which has a half second delay we've determined, but... It's good to be here. I, I don't have to wear pants. Uh, there's not that social pressure to wear pants. Yep. Uh, I'm wearing pants, but Jared Leto is not. Oh, he's not. And I see he's tied mm. up and, and gagged because <laughs> that, that's, that's how he likes to isolate, though. Yes, exactly. Well, Brian, uh, there are people out there. You know, I, I do miss uh, comedy shows. The comedy shows are not on. Stephen Colbert is trying to do some things yeah. from his bathtub and his porch. And I think mm -hmm. that's actually welcomed because people need to laugh right now. Well, yeah. You know, I've had a really mixed feelings about the late night comedy shows in the, in the last few years, because I don't know, it just seems like it's not so funny anymore. What's happening in the world. What's, you know, particularly <laughs> in the U S things have, have taken such a weird turn that it, it sometimes feels, uh, uh, ridiculous to just keep making jokes about it and, and pretend like it's all the same, but, um, I agree. And you know, it's the, the comedy shows like that have, have for like a lot of people, including me, it's, it's my main source of news really. Right. Well, it, it's, yeah. Cause if you got a busy life and I do not, um, then that is going to, uh, be the place where you, I, I do watch a lot of news and I do miss a lot of things. The things that make you angriest, they tend to, uh, the highlight. So I don't know. We're here with you. If you are socially isolating, uh, Brian and I are here to make your day go better because uh, you may have run out of Netflix. You may have reached the end of Netflix. Uh, speaking of which, uh, I know you did too. I watched Contagion on Netflix. <laughs> yes, so did I. And uh, I thought it was actually a good idea to watch. Like, yeah. It's, the, the film holds up well. It's really well researched. It's not a ridiculous, overblown Hollywood kind of look at it. Um, I think it's a good look at this kind of a outbreak. Now that one did affect, kill 30% of the people and they died violently rather quickly on buses and so forth. And, yeah, and they the, foreshadowed fake news a lot. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole plot line about people kind of, uh, you know, profiting off of, uh, the news cycle. Yeah. It's, it's a good watch. Yeah. Well, it's on Netflix in Canada and, uh. Yeah, no, I, I, I said this on social media that uh, as soon as we watched it, my, my kid went upstairs and checked his, uh, his uh, one of his social media accounts and his friend was posting video down the street of ambulances and fire trucks wiping down surfaces on somebody's mm -hmm. house across the street. <laughs> and yeah. He freaked out and yeah, we were already in a freaked out state. It was a bit of an overreaction, but um, yeah, it brought it home. It brought it home. And our part of the world still i think there's eight or nine confirmed cases in our province here in canada 
Uh, so I don't know. I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe we shut things down, uh, soon enough here. Maybe, maybe it won't be as bad here. We were one of the last places in Canada to register a confirmed case. And yet our actions of shutting things down through social pressure, not through initiative of the government here, I don't think, um, shut things down the same time as everyone else. So we'll see in a few weeks if that shutting down at a slightly earlier stage than say Vancouver or Ontario um, actually benefited us here. We'll see. Yeah. I'm still terrified to go out. I picked up my daughter from school yesterday. Um, she she decided to go. It was optional. There was three kids in the class and uh, no one around. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's the middle of March. You don't end school in the middle of March and carry your stuff home. It's just, uh, it's unsettling. And, but we do have to, to stop thinking about it anyway. We can't think about it well, too much. That is one thing I wanted to ask you about, because I know you're a real news junkie. Like, you really consume a lot of it, oh, but yes. you must have to kind of uh, maybe measure how you do it, do it differently, because obviously we all want to be informed, uh, but you don't want to drive yourself insane. And I was kind of at the insane point the other night. I, I'd had too much. I was snapping at my family. I was telling people, <laughs> <laughs> you know, things are different now. Take your puffers, kids, and uh, wash your hands, and uh, yeah, now I I... The pressure got to me, and I was—I uh, didn't sleep well one night. And yeah, fortunately, uh, cannabis is legal in Canada, and it can relax a person. Not that I do it, but uh, no, it's possible. Of course not. It is possible for somebody to do that. So yeah, we're all stressed out. We're all stuck in our homes, and that's going to be unpleasant. Although uh, we're kind of used to it in Canada. At least we have that going for us up here, where it's very cold. We. Uh, not in Vancouver, but where we are in the prairies, it's very cold and we, we get stuck in our homes a lot. Yeah. And again, where we are, um, there's a million people in our province, but the province is large. So we already have a certain amount of social isolation just because of the nature of our place. So again, I'm, I'm hoping that will be to our benefit. But well, the rural people, the people in the small farming towns go to the coffee shop and uh, yeah. that's their social media. Well, of course, now it's Facebook. Yeah. A lot of crap on Facebook too. My God, there's a lot of crap. It's uh, it's terrible. But let's start by looking at the news. I know we'd wanted to talk about uh, oil prices for uh, a, a few weeks on the podcast. So this is probably as good a time as any to to talk about it. I heard as low as fifteen dollars a barrel. I think I saw twenties, twenty five today in Canada. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. I don't know. It's, oh, you mean it's projections? Very, oh, no, no, the actual prices. So that's maybe 25 Canadian dollars and maybe 15 US dollars. Oh, well, no, our, I think our oil is just priced less here. It's not the dollar conversion. Right. We are, our, our oil is worth less for some reason. It sounds like you have a frying pan in the, the bomb shelter there. Is that just a uh, audio equipment that clanged? Oh, that's my, uh, my travel mug that I'm using. It's okay. a, uh, it's got a, it's got a metal casing to it. It's not Leto or anything. <laughs> no. Leto! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> So yeah, um, uh, this this actually uh, affects my e bike bike purchasing because the Canadian dollar is flirty with sixty nine cents. And, oh yeah, uh, yeah, that's going to be hard. I um, yeah, I don't know. What do you and, think? Well, and then that leads us to a discussion about the price of gasoline. Yes, which relates to clean energy because, of course, some people are worried that low gas prices will slow the adoption of. Uh, electric vehicles. I'm not so sure. I mean, I think it's an inevitable thing, but uh, gas prices in Regina as low as 68.9 cents a liter at Costco. Now you have to have a membership to buy at Costco, but... Uh, You're there buying toilet you know, paper anyway. That's, uh, that's really low. I haven't seen gas prices this low for what decades i was going to ask you like i my, i was telling my kids this goes back definitely before you were born i mean was there a dip after 9 11 i don't recall obviously we could have researched all this and been prepared uh, <laughs> what? but you know what who what's has time when you're isolating at home to research yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember it being in the 80s, it being around 40 cents, 35 cents, 40 cents oh, a liter. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, I used to work at a gas station. It was 29 cents a liter. And there was okay. this price war that went on for months and months and months. <laughs> and uh, that was the norm. It was actually a, a station to station, company to company price war. And then mm -hmm. we were giving coupons for $2 back. Wow. From, uh, yeah. So that was, that was crazy. 
Anyway, I, I, so at regular gas stations, kind of like 75 cents, but yeah, that's crazy low. That's just so much lower than it's been in, in years. I, I don't think it's going to slow the adoption of electric vehicles. I mean, you know, all of these companies are, are spending a lot of money to make the transition. So, um, you know, it's unfortunate, I guess. I don't know how to look at it, but. I've got a theory on this. Okay. Hear me out. Okay. Because okay. my theories are, 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 are crazy usually, uh, but I still okay. have them, Brian. I still have them. <laughs> you Does can't mean... stop yourself. <laughs> well, it's good to have theories. Um, here's uh -huh. my theory. That if people got used, I, I like I, I couldn't like I can't believe right now that people can fill an SUV for 110 bucks or their truck for 150 bucks or whatever it is, right? Oh, it's crazy. I've seen people, yeah, spend almost 200 bucks at a pump. And you sit there pumping the sucker. Um, my car takes forty dollars. The Prius takes forty dollars when prices are moderately high. When they're high, it rarely goes over forty dollars. So you can pump that fairly quickly, but to sit out there like a jackass at minus 40 pumping a <laughs> truck, you got to think that the, the convenience of not going to a gas station would, will be even greater for the people who have larger vehicles. Anyway, here's yeah. my, here's my theory. The theory goes as this people are, seems happy right now to spend a dollar 20 a liter and 150 bucks a tank or whatever it is for larger vehicles. However, if they get used to lower prices, then they have that shock again um, say, when they come up, say, say it goes up and to that a year from now or three quarters of a year from now or a year from half from now, they get used to low prices. My theory is that they're, they're going to have that sticker shock again, that, that price shock again, and they're going to say, Hey, what's, what's that? What else is available? Just a yeah. theory. Yeah. And of course it will be better and more convenient for them to, to charge at home, but they just don't know that yet. No, no, not all of them. Um, although things are changing. Is there an update on your car, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? Is that too personal? Yeah, so I ordered a Tesla Model 3 Standard Range Plus, and the update it is that it's in Calgary, and we have signed the papers, personally, and it's going through. Currently being quarantined in Calgary until <laughs> Quarantined in Calgary. It's, uh, I don't know, it has to be processed. You had said something about, you know, processed for the Canadian market because it's an imported vehicle from the U.S., so uh, I guess there's something they have to do there. But, uh, yeah, I think it's close. We signed all the paperwork. They're, they said they were looking for somebody to transport the car here from Calgary to uh, Regina. Let me ask you this. Are you excited? Yeah, I'm really excited. I mean, uh, I, mean I wish it, it hadn't uh, happened in the middle of a global pandemic, but, uh, you know, it, it's the future. So, yeah, I'm excited. So what else do you want to talk about this week? I was thinking about Elon Musk. Well, yeah, we should talk about that because production finally was halted at the Tesla factory in California just today, I believe. Yeah, just uh, today, Musk, by the sheriff. Yeah, Mu Musk was trying to, yeah, keep it open and, and the sheriff had to, uh, to shut them down to comply. So, yeah, that's a little disappointing that they didn't uh, act sooner in doing that. Have you seen his um, emails? Yeah, Musk seems to be uh, trying to downplay uh, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, which, you know, doesn't seem like a great idea. I mean, I think, uh, it, I mean, you sort of think twice about it because he's a very smart guy. So he said something about looking at the numbers and thinking that it's not going to be a big deal. And, you know, he's, he's been right about lots of other things. Let me interrupt you. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you if you're a fanboy and you just failed the fanboy test. You're clearly okay. still a fanboy. <laughs> I'm very okay. pissed off at Elon Musk and very hurt <laughs> by this whole thing because yeah. he's like a climate denier. It's it's quite easy to look at numbers and say <laughs> the numbers are there. Mm -hmm. If we do nothing, it's a very bad thing. China got shut down and it's still only flattening the curve now, like two months later or whatever. Well, three months, uh, four months after it started or whatever it was in mid-November. So mm -hmm. I think it's very hard to argue that it's, that it's being made a bigger deal than it is and that we should shut down, uh, we should not shut down factories or we should not. And I think it's also, uh, I strongly believe this, that it's much worse in the States because of their lack of testing and that they're way behind. In fact, I'm very worried for the United States and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. It's because a lot of our first cases... Uh, came from, oh, somebody who traveled to Las Vegas. You look up Las Vegas, they have zero cases. Or yeah, they had one case. They or they traveled to Ohio. They no, been testing, yeah. 
Then, no surprise here, they traveled to uh, the States and they came back with Corona. While well, you look at the place where they came back from, there was one or zero cases. So they don't know the full extent of it. Uh, I believe that uh, we'll find out in certainly one to three weeks how the United States is doing. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be very bad. And of course, the answer is, I think, to shut down as soon as possible, because the sooner you shut down, the sooner you can open up again. It's, uh, we, we got to do it now, and then maybe everything will be back to normal sooner. And maybe we could figure out some ways of doing things, you know, half-assed, like uh, restaurants with one-third capacity carefully spread out, or uh, factories running certain kinds of shifts where people don't interact, and um, a lot of precautions are taken, and... Uh, sort of a, a minimal restarting. I don't know. I'm not an expert. I have my theories, as you know, but I'm not an expert. Yeah. So uh, we started this podcast uh, because we're not experts. Is that what we're, we're saying? <laughs> we're not experts. We're fans. This is, a, ah. this is a fan show. We can't, we can't tell people we're experts, but to the novice person who hasn't been nose deep in this stuff for 10 years, like we have, or 20 years even, uh, mm -hmm. we're experts, relative experts, but we're not, we're not the big YouTube, uh, powerhouses out there. Well, as you know, James, I built a, a solar panel for my grade eight science project. I forgot that so fact. I've been in this for a long time, not a, um, uh, like a solar air heating panel, not, um, not the other kind. So What's basically kind a Jiffy Pop can painted black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was something like that. It didn't generate electricity. It just generated heat. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, this is a, a future that I've been really uh, looking for since the 70s. Sure. And it was promised to us. You know, I had a calculator I'm, in the 70s that had a solar panel on it, and it worked yeah. from, from the, the light on the roof. So I figured, hey, this is the thing. No, we still have a calculator, a solar calculator from the 80s that still works. It's kind of amazing. You know, doesn't it have to have some sort of battery or maybe a capacitor of some sort? That stores. Uh, I don't know, but it, it still works. I don't think we've ever changed anything in it. That's amazing. Yeah. It's only 40% so, efficient now. Getting back to production. So yeah, Tesla has finally shut down their factory. They'd started to deliver the Tesla Model Y, which has been widely anticipated. Have you looked at the videos? Uh, yeah, I've looked at a couple of videos. So the, the Model Y is out in the wild. There's a, a few people have it. Uh, it looks great. Yeah. I think it looks fantastic and there's telling us, and I, I thought this was true with the model three, that pictures and video, and I saw tons of pictures and video. And then our friend Adrian got a red model three and I thought, holy cow, this is the sexiest thing I've ever seen. M yeah. Better in person. Mind you, we don't see Ferraris driving around where we live. <laughs> Not yeah. too often. We don't see the higher end, uh, supercars, but this was a fine looking car then. And the picture somehow didn't do it justice. And that's what they're saying about the, the Y, which was kind of underwhelming when they first released it. Yeah. I looking at the pictures, I don't think it's, I think the model three looks better, but of course the, 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 the Y's got more utility. People love that form factor in general. So, you know, it's going to sell like hotcakes once, uh, once we, you know, uh, get back from the global pandemic. Yeah, and the height of the roof is like seven inches higher. And that, that's one of my complaints about the three. And, and it has to do with the fact that I don't bend. I'm basically a six, six foot tall stick that does not bend. Yep. And um, mm -hmm. I just cannot get in and out of those cars very comfortably as my head gets stuck. And okay. um, my leaf is a lot more of towards that form factor. It's a lot taller. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot taller than our Prius, um, but it's not the Y. So I like that. I've never really craved an SUV before, but I do like the form factor of comfort of having that headroom and the high, you know, I'm getting old and out of shape and it's easier to get up from a high position than it is a low position when you're getting out of the vehicle as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, the, like when the model three, when mine arrives, it'll actually be the first four door sedan I've ever owned. Actually not, that's not true. I had a, a Nissan Sentra for a brief while that I blew up for a movie I was making. Rightfully so. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, it was a low cost used vehicle that I, I literally blew up, but yeah, I've never been a fan of sedans, but, uh, yeah, I made the choice to go with the three rather than the Y cause the Y's the cheaper models of the Y are still a long way away and it's, it's going to be more money in the long run and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, man, I, uh, I, I, I wish they were more attainable. Um, I wish they yeah. were 
sort of a, a low end or a lower end uh, vehicle that you could get uh, without any uh, any fun stuff on it or something like that. But it's going to be a spectacular. I'm I'm excited about the cargo space. That really looks massive to me. Oh yeah, absolutely. the The one thing I wanted to mention about it um, is that it has a heat pump to heat the yeah, cabin. That's so. A good thing. This is something we've talked about before on the podcast, but the Model 3 has a normal resistive heater, which works well and quickly, but it uses a lot of energy. Uh, the Model Y now has gone to a heat pump to heat the cabin. So again, heating with electricity, but it's just uh, way more efficient. So the, that'll be great for cold climates, especially like, uh, like ours, where people have to use a lot of cabin heat. But again, it probably only works between, you know, plus five Celsius to minus 15 Celsius. Yeah, something like that, but... And you know, in our weather here, it seems to go from plus 5 to minus 40 or minus 20, you know, like, or 15. Like, it, it really... We we joke about it, but it really does seem like there's no in-between here in uh, where yeah. we live. But it should help with efficiency. Um, they do make noise, which is an interesting drawback when you're in an EV, is because they do make noise. It's like... When the air conditioner is on in the Nissan Leaf, my 13 Nissan Leaf, it it's you hear it because there's nothing else yeah. going on, right? It's the only whir of uh, something mechanically moving if you're at a stoplight or in the driveway. Mm -hmm. So the heat pump makes the same kind of noise because it's basically the same mechanism, but it just works in reverse. Instead of delivering cold, it delivers heat. Right. But that is, a, is an encouraging thing. Some people were disappointed that there was no heat pump in the Model 3. Because in the States, when we're, when they talk about cold, it's, it's heat pump weather for sure. Yeah, it's, for it's sure. In that range. Yeah. yeah. And even for lots of Canada too, Ontario, Toronto area. Um, yeah. Not cold like here. So I was reading this morning that the Norwegian Automobile Federation has done some winter tests. And speaking of not too cold, I think they did a lot of them at minus two, which they consider winter in Norway, at least in the populated mm -hmm. parts of Norway, even though it does span the Arctic Circle. Um, and I, I won't go into all the tests, but I did note that the Bolt, which is rebranded as the Ampra in, um, in Europe, made, still made by Chevrolet and GM, was the worst with a 30% loss, which mm -hmm. doesn't seem that terrible, but minus two, maybe so, because you're using your heater full time as you know, you're basically using thousands and thousands of watts of electricity like five mm -hmm. or six hair dryers all at the same time just to heat your cabin. It's amazing what what heat you need to create with electricity. And the Kona mm -hmm. was best at 18%. And uh, they also cha uh, tested charging speeds because charging speeds can slow down in cold weather, which doesn't really affect you because you're charging overnight anyway, right? Charging mm -hmm. really isn't that important except for trips. And people want to know where's the weak spot? Where, where am I going to suffer? Where am I going to make compromises? And they, they want to know what the charging speed is on trips. And then Chevrolet, uh, with the bolt is slow on that, as we talked about before, just 50 kilowatts and it's a slow, and they, they haven't updated that either last week when we mm -hmm. talked about that. The Kona, however, um, is not getting sold. So they're making the Hyundai, um, groups and uh, their sister company is not making bad EVs. They're making surprisingly good EVs better than the North American, uh, companies, uh, even though GM has been at it for a long time, because they're the most efficient. In fact, I think they surpassed the, the Tesla model three for a while. And then the model three is now more efficient or something like that. Yeah. Briefly, the Hyundai Ionic was the most efficient vehicle ever made, but then the, the model three took, took the crown back. This is important. It's like fuel efficiency for EVs because the more efficient you are, the smaller battery you need. Like, uh, who, which one? Some of these luxury makers are coming out with massive batteries that weigh a, four, a ton, well, tons, and they produce only half of what Tesla does as far as range goes. Yeah, of course, it's all about energy density, and you can't just put as big a battery as you want in a car because then you're just adding so much weight. So yeah, a lot of the, the manufacturers are really struggling with that uh, efficiency. They, they have to put in these gigantic batteries, which hurts their efficiency and they're still not, you know, where Tesla is. So Tesla is talking about coming, well, rumored to be coming out with a more energy dense battery, which means you get a lot more returns on that. It's sort of exponential because if you can have a smaller battery with the same energy, 
then the car goes that much further. And also cost is a big deal when you're having to, and you have elite, an inefficient car, electric car, yeah. and you have to add more batteries and the cost takes off as well too. But I will say this, Hyundai is not selling very many vehicles. They're not pushing their vehicles, right? No, they're just not making enough of them. I think they could sell more, but their production is limited. You know, they still have all these gas cars they've got to sell. Sounds like they maybe have difficulty getting enough batteries. So, I, yeah, they're decent cars, but um, they're a long way away from mainstream adoption. Which is too bad because they're doing a good job at it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saddened by that. Well, I'm very saddened by Elon Musk uh, being a... A crazy ass denier. It makes me lose faith in faith in him. I, he's an incredibly important person. Uh, he's moving. I think he's literally achieved uh, moving the electrification of transportation transportation ahead ten years, like he aimed to do. I think mission accomplished. We need to keep him alive and healthy to keep that going. I think the Y is going to sell incredibly well if you compare it to uh, other cars in that class. Um, it will be so so much better so the technology will be better the comfort the the um just the style and, and engineering of the way things work you push a button at the back your seats fall down there's that middle seat which i love it just goes down and you can throw skis in in my case or uh, surfboards if you're that kind of person or lumber which is something yeah. that i do so yeah, i love it which brings us to Volkswagen, because uh, they are now on the verge of releasing the Volkswagen ID3, right. which is their first mainstream, high production level uh, electric vehicle. And their uh, Electrek is reporting that they are currently stockpiling completed uh, ID3s uh, in Germany. There's now uh, perhaps, th yeah, thousands of them in a parking lot in Germany. So, um, they're stockpiling and apparently they're going to release them all at once. And so there's actually been some speculation that maybe uh, the software is not ready yet. So uh, it will have over the air updates. It sounds like, like, uh, like Tesla does and software is really important for these cars. So uh, yeah, there's speculation that they're stockpiling them because the, the software still needs some tweaks. Right. I was wondering why they were stockpiling them because you know, Tesla will trickle them out. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting to see the, the contrast between the way Tesla releases a car like the Y, which you start to see in the wild. And then, you know, one guy in California gets it. And I saw mm -hmm. one of our favorite YouTubers out there, Ben Sullins offered 500 bucks to see it. <laughs> so what kind of money is he making if he can offer 500 bucks to, to be the first to, to have a look at it? And, um, I don't know. It's just, it's a crazy world we live in, but the, the trickling, of the Model Ys that are coming out now uh, create huge media attention when there's like five of them out there. Um, so what's it going to be like when Volkswagen releases, I don't know, 20,000 of them all at once and suddenly they're everywhere in Europe? It's going to be strange, but, you know, they have been probably the most ambitious of the other automakers, the traditional automakers, for the, the plans that they're making uh, they, they plan to sell uh, millions of electric vehicles in the next few years. So, uh, looks like it's finally close to starting. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it and it'll be interesting to see what it's like when, when everything just sort of is suddenly there and you see them everywhere. It's, I'm hoping they're also saying, Brian, that it's going to be a cheap car, right? It was 20,000, 22,000 after incentives. Didn't I read that? Yeah, something like that. But of course, they're not releasing, they're releasing it in Europe first. So right. we'll have to wait and see for them to, to come to either Canada or the US. Uh, but yeah, I think it'll be a decent price and with different range options. So the cheapest one will probably not be great on the range, but uh, but it's a start. Right. I'm looking for, and this is because my I bought two new Priuses uh, because my wife uses them for work. And they were around. Not at the same time. Not at the same time. No. Um, one after the <laughs> other. 2012 and one uh, a couple of years ago. So they were around 27, eight, let's say sticker price. If yep. an EV hits that price. Yeah. And you factor in the savings, no oil changes. And, uh, even with cheap gas, electricity is often cheaper. The convenience and the extra performance, the superiority of EVs. Um, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Cause it's going to take off. That's my price point. Yeah. What I'm looking for. 
Absolutely. And and when I decided to buy the, the Tesla Model 3, I was going off of the, uh, you know, internet stories that say it's, it's uh, cheaper than a Toyota Camry over five years. So mm-hmm. uh, that... I'm not sure I totally believe that it's, it's at least it's in the, the realm, but, um, yeah, it's going to have to come lower for, for mainstream adoption. All right, Brian, I wanted to talk about some things that I saw in the news. Uh, case is unveiling an all 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 electric backhoe with 90% lower cost of operation. Um, that's phenomenal. A backhoe. That's amazing. So what a lot of people, I, I, I think who are less casual than us don't realize is that there's a lot of things that are electrifying. We talked about e-bikes this week and we'll, we'll get into that again a little bit, but, uh, and scooters and skateboards and everything in between. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact is the farm machinery and everything from giant mining trucks, which, uh, are interesting because they're so bloody big. They're the, mm-hmm. they're, 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 they seem unreal. They seem like something out of a movie, but they're, they're massively huge trucks and they re- regenerate their electricity with their massive weight as they go down into the mining pit and they make a lot of that electricity back that you actually don't have to put, use a lot of electricity because you're going up and down with this heavy mm-hmm. weight and it regenerates itself when it goes downhill and has lots of torque going uphill. Well, this is true for other things and even backhoes now because the, this is what's going to, you know, you and I don't buy backhoes. When's the last time you bought a backhoe? Ah, I mean, maybe the, the eighties, you know, it was, a, it was a different time. Backhoes were big there. A lot of, a lot yeah. of things going on, serial killers, burying people. So the backhoe is bought by companies. And when companies buy things, they look at the bottom line, unlike regular people who don't seem to care when they buy an SUV that takes $150 yeah. to fill. They don't care. They they thinking, yeah, I want that. It's going to make my penis t- uh, two inches longer. So I'm just going to buy mm. this uh, Escalade. So what regular people do is not the same as what companies do. I try to operate mm-hmm. my house like a company, and I calculate the long-term costs. I look at my kilometers per year, how much I'm paying on gas on average, and I figure it out. Yes, we save money doing this. And I, I pointed out that my leaf is actually free based on the savings. It's ca- saving me over five years on... Uh, on what it's replacing. So it's free. Yeah. Cause you, 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 uh, it's a used one. You paid very little for it and it's, uh, it's worked. And it's replacing an SUV, which I just n- now use for towing a camper in the summer. It's only registered for a month or two in the summer, but it was using premium gas. It was old, was big and, uh, change that as our city car to a leaf and it's free over five years. Free. People say yeah. EVs are expensive. Well, how's free too expensive <laughs> for you? So anyway, and the great thing about these, when, when, uh, companies, um, order backhoes and things, I mean, they're running all day and there's diesel exhaust, so you don't have the noise. So it makes for a, a more pleasant uh, work site when you have less noise, right? Because, and less fumes, which probably yeah. are killing people. And this is true for school buses as well. School buses are starting to electrify now. City buses are electrifying now hundreds of them at a time around the world and in places where you wouldn't expect like South America is largely converting to electric buses and we're not. Yeah. And my pet peeve about diesel engines in general, like you always see school buses and they always leave them idling. And I, I think it's because again, we're in a colder climate, but I think older diesel engines from the seventies were not that great in the cold. So there's sort of this mentality developed that, Oh, it's a diesel. You've got to leave it running. And uh, that's never gone away. You don't need to anymore, but people are constantly leaving their diesel uh, buses and trucks running. It drives me insane. And there's been studies done about school children, and the exhaust from diesel is not the exhaust from a gas engine. It's worse. It's, it's, it's worse, It's yeah. worse for you. And, uh, and not just the kids coming and going from the buses that are all sitting there outside the school, but when you're actually on the bus, there's fumes inside the bus. Studies have shown that. So everything's going to electrify. Farm machinery is going to electrify. So you won't have to go off the town to, to have, you know, the diesel truck come and fill up your tank and then have people steal the diesel from your tank or whatever. Mm-hmm. You can just charge up overnight if you're connected to the grid. And if you were a smart farmer and had some money to invest, you would invest in a large solar array because that would cut down the cost even further. And you would have the land to do that as freely as you would like. And I think if I was a farmer, I would have a large solar array and I would electrify my machinery as I could. 
I don't think combines will, will do that because they have to go 24 hours a day. There's no time to stop and, and, and uh, refuel. But then again, they're only used once a year, right? Yeah. And isn't there even a, like a lower class of fuel for farm vehicles? I just have this vague recollection that there's like a lower, you know, like a more polluting right. fuel. Does that make like purple gas was a thing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like farmers I, I, well, in Saskatchewan. Well, I think that was because... Of, it could be because it's a lower grade, but it could also be because it was taxed free if you were a farmer. Remember when there was F's on our cars around here? Yeah, they were able to to buy gas at a different tax rate or something. Yeah, and, and that might come back once carbon taxes start, uh, you know, they're worried about how the agricultural community is going to deal with that. But the thing about some of these machines, if you're looking at, let's say, a farm tractor or something, is that they have incredible torque and they have incredible... Uh, multi-wheel drives on them, which can sometimes reverse, have a negative torque vector on them. So you're, mm -hmm. you can go over literally a rock pile uh, a lot more easily. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I think people don't realize that that's going to cut into oil profits as well, is all these things from buses to school buses to um, industrial equipment are all going to use electricity because it's cheaper a lot cheaper 90 percent less i mean that's that's huge because they don't have to maintain it there's no downtime and uh the fuel is that much cheaper so that's incredible to me yeah which brings me to the kind of last news item i wanted to talk about which is that uh, uh hawaii has filed a lawsuit against 10 oil and gas companies this is another story from uh, Electrek. So this is the other thing that's happening is the oil and gas companies are getting sued kind of the same way the tobacco companies got sued because, you know, they know that they're uh, screwing up the planet and uh, did nothing about it. Yeah, that, that could be big. Although the oil companies, I would argue, are probably more powerful than even tobacco and, yep. and have just as many and, and more uh, lobbyists and power in Washington and places of uh, political power. So it'll be interesting to see how that, that plays out. Uh, it's, pr I would say on the surface, it seems easier to prove that smoking hurts people. Uh, you smoke mm -hmm. cigarettes, you have lung cancer, so there's statistics for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have to see where that goes. I'm, I'm hopeful that it does something, but I'm also hopeful that the whole reason we do our podcast here is talking about how the technological revolution is going to clean things up too. Yeah, exactly. Technology is going to probably um, cha yeah, change things before a, a lawsuit will, but it, it just feels good that there's something that people can do. So if you're the kind of person or, or state or province or city that, that can file a lawsuit, um, I'm sure it feels good to like you're actually doing something to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 it tells the public that it's not okay uh, because uh, leadership in the States is, is telling people uh, drill, baby, drill type of thing. It's, it's a different kind of message um, yeah. like that. Uh, I have to tell you, uh, the, I have e-bike fever. <laughs> I've been watching YouTube videos. I've been thinking about it. And I just, I, everything I look at is is financially not viable for me. I'm They keep shooting over $1,000, whether I get a kit or a bike itself. And uh there's really not much available in Canada. Um, I, I talked about the Walmart bike last week and, mm -hmm. uh, like there's a thousand dollar version of that on Amazon, I think, which not a version of that, but with similar specs, similar appearance, but better quality bike, uh, with disc brakes and just a better, better frame and components. But, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I've got fever. I'm crazy if to do this. And I, 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 I don't want to compromise. I, I don't want to have like, oh, I wish I had a more powerful motor or, oh, I wish I had range. But I fantasize. I mean, just going off into the countryside. This could change yeah, my life. I'm at the same kind of place because, yeah, I know you're a bike guy, so you definitely don't want to buy a cheap bike. So, yeah, I want to buy something of decent quality as well. But, yeah, the stuff of decent quality is still uh, quite expensive. Very, very expensive. Um now a lot of, I mean, bikes themselves are expensive, right? I mean, generally if yeah. you buy a decent bike, uh, I bought a used bike for like $400, but I think it would have been $3,000, uh, um, originally at the store. So, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So bikes can be very expensive just by themselves when you add some, some components to them. I was tempted to get the front reel, uh, hub motor, but I keep reading that you can't use them off road. 
like if you go on even on a slight trail that they'll spin and mm -hmm. you will die you will oh interesting impale, impale yourself into a tree quite easily and um, that's too bad because those are the cheapest and simplest ways of doing it there's also the mid-drive motor which hooks up to your pedals sort of where your pedals go through the the axle of your pedals you take that out and replace it with a motor that hangs mm -hmm. low which gives you less clearance but that's not too much i don't plan on doing crazy mountain biking but i would like to go on trails and i'm hoping that uh, e-bikes don't get banned from trails because they, they, they may start to get banned from trails, but mm -hmm. um, it's just the ones with the throttles. I mean, you can go 50 kilometers an hour and so on. Um, I just want to pedal assist where I feel like I'm Lance Armstrong, but I, I'm James Winningham. You know what I mean? They, they say mm -hmm. it gives you that impression that <laughs> you could just pedal and you really go. Um, I've tried some cheaper e-bikes where the throttle just goes and you, yeah, you can go a bit faster, but I'm looking for something that gives me the freedom to explore nature and uh, bring happiness. And with this plague that is upon us now, I'm trying to think mm -hmm. of something that I could look forward to, but the Canadian, because of oil prices, the Canadian dollar has dipped to all time, well, not all time lows, but recent lows of like 69 cents or something. And they're saying it's going to go down to 67 cents. So unless the American economy collapses, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to face a high dollar to try and do this. So it's going to be hard. And the Walmart but bike, could, by the way, uh, is sold out. So there's a big demand. Oh for yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, yeah, and it could, if it's a, it's a kit to convert your current bike, uh, I could give you a project to do well, uh, while we're all in lockdown. Sure. Here. But I, you know, I watched the YouTube videos. They do it in like 10 minutes. It's actually not that hard. Oh yeah. Not that hard. You take one wheel so on, why does you put another wheel on. Why does the hub motor spin off road, whereas the other motor doesn't? Uh, because it's your front wheel. Oh, so there's not enough weight on it. Yeah, there's not enough weight on it. And then there's at times where, because it's pulling you instead of pushing you, that it will spin. And because it's steering you as well, um, that can cause problems. Now, if you're just using it as a commuter and you're trying to, you're saying you're going to be on pavement all the time or maybe just a flat trail, like a flat gravel trail, then you're probably going to be okay with the front wheel. Or we could find out <laughs> and get back to our listeners. Yeah, and I have been looking at e-bikes as well. Yeah, I haven't really come up with any kind of uh, solution or, or answer. But uh, yeah, it's sort of frustrating. I kind of find this with bikes in general, like you were alluding to the fact that, you know, a decent bike is quite expensive. It's a whole, it, it's like you can't just go out and buy a bike. Like it's got to become your hobby. Like there's just so much to research. Like, a, like an electric it just, car. Yeah. It just seems the whole biking world is kind of complicated to me. And, uh, I wish it was kind of simple like it was in the seventies. Yeah. You went and bought a 10 speed and, uh, I went off to the disco, I guess. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Well, Brian, uh, we've been self-isolating here trying to help other people with their self-isolation. Uh, I hope everyone's doing well. Remember to wash your hands and don't pick your nose. And let us know how you're doing. You can contact us at uh, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. And we're on uh, Twitter. On Twitter. The Twitter is uh, CLN Energy Show uh, on Twitter. I got that wrong last time. I'm sorry about that. So uh, check us out. If you're listening to us, you have all the contact information in the show notes. We'd also like to hear from you uh, if you want to leave us a voice message or any questions you have. No question is stupid. No question is too small or too big. Well, most questions are too big because we won't be able to answer them, but we can certainly research and try to explain it. So it's been good talking to you, Brian. I hope things are well in the bomb shelter. Yeah, things are great. I, I think this worked out pretty well, recording in two different locations, so we'll probably continue that. And we'll see you again next week, unless one of us <laughs> gets a fever. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. Thanks.